It gives us an atmosphere of mercy. So we have a steadfast, loving kindness. Grace, we have unmerited favor and love. We have perfect forgiveness. The past, the present, and the future has been forgiven for you by Christ Jesus. And we also have a righteousness. We have a holiness and justification before Him as we stand before Him. And it's for us to spiritually grow. Many times we try to grow using shame and guilt and it just does nothing but keep us put down. He's taken away the shame and the guilt in your life by giving you a brand new nature. A brand new nature. So when those old thoughts come in, I'm not good enough, throw that out. That's not who you are. You are good enough to serve the Lord. There's nothing you've done that keeps you from serving the Lord if you place your faith and trust in Him. Has He not forgiven everything? Absolutely He has. What's one thing that keeps reoccurring in your heart, maybe on a daily basis, that doesn't have the permission yet to leave? Whatever that is, go to God with that. Let Him look at that with you and get that taken care of because He's already taken care of it. He loves you that much. See, amazingly, He did not dole out little by little all of this mercy, grace, and perfect righteousness and perfect forgiveness. He didn't dole it out little by little, but all at once. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Why? Because we're united with Christ Jesus. We're going to look at that more also. And even before He made the world, God loved you and chose you in Christ to be holy without fault in His eyes. And I want to tell you, if you're holy and without fault in the eyes of God, you're holy and without fault. <clears throat> Don't be using your own eyes and your own mind to determine who you are in Christ. You let God tell you who you are, and you let Him tell you how much He loves you, and you let Him tell you how much He thinks about you. God decided, verse 4, God decided in advance to adopt you into His own family by bringing you to Himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him, look at this, it gave him great pleasure. Did you know that God gives, it gives him great pleasure to have you and his family? It's amazing, the love of God. So what do we do? Verse 6, we praise God for the glorious grace, this unmerited favor, this love he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. And we read in Romans chapter 5, 25, it says God pours out his love, and that poured means like a waterfall, his love to the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And there's enough to splash out over everybody you're around. It's God's love. In verse 7, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased your freedom with the blood of His very own Son and perfectly forgave you of every one of your sins. Amazing. He showered us with kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. You got the full package. You've got the wisdom, you've got discernment, you've got understanding, you've got forgiveness, <clears throat> you've got righteousness, you've got it all, and you did nothing to earn it. Because if you go to Ephesians chapter 2, it says you were dead in your trespasses and sin, and you became alive with Christ. It was Him that brought you alive. So now, He showered His kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us His mysterious will regarding Christ. What is that? Which is to fulfill His own good plan. Well, what's the plan? Verse 10, here's the plan. Scripture's not that hard, is it? Here's the plan at the right time. He's going to bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. And furthermore, because we're united with Christ, we receive an inheritance from God. You even get an inheritance. He shows us in advance, and He makes everything work out according to His plan. Now, several Sundays ago, all this came forth in His new covenant ushered through us through His Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke taught last Sunday on the atonement of Christ, the beginning of the era of grace that we now reside in, and he'll have more to say about that in the future. Today we're considering God's goodness or the goodness of God. Many a believer knows God is good, but not necessarily good to them. Yeah, I know He's good to these other people. I see them doing well, but maybe not so much to me. I don't know that He really cares about me that much. Those feelings can become a truth. You never want your feelings to become a truth unless that feeling is from the truth. You can't make God love you any more than He does. He has a perfect love for you. Many a believer knows God is good, but not necessarily good to them. And they know that verse everyone quotes as a last resort when life gets difficult, confusing and even seeming hopeless. 
trying to regroup, trying to refocus, trying to find that peace that surpasses all understanding. They say, yeah, okay, but I know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. But many, while quoting that verse, what is their motive? Is one trying to hope to believe that God's goodness causes everything to work together for His good? Or do they truly believe, regardless of what seems to be backwards in their life at the time, maybe even evil in their current happenings, maybe they're thinking, maybe I don't love Him enough or I'm not doing what He has called me to do. Because the verse says, God causes all things to work for the good for those who love Him and called according to His purpose. And all things do not seem to be working out for me. Pastor, can you help me understand how God works everything together in such a way? Well, yes, I can. I certainly will. God works all things together for the good by using every situation to transform us, to fulfill His divine purpose, and to bring you and me about our ultimate good, all within the framework of His all-knowing and all His love. See, this assurance allows you and me to trust Him even in the midst of difficult circumstances, knowing that He is always at work for our benefit. Please believe me, the Lord is always at work for your benefit. You're His child. Trish, you don't think your mama Anna would didn't do anything for you because she loved you so much? Everything she'd want to do is for your benefit. Well, think about the Lord. You're His child. You don't think He wouldn't do more for you? than even a mother or father, especially a mother, would do for her child. That's how loving He is. But we get this wrong idea of who God is by experiencing in our life the difficult things going on, and we start to identify in other things, and He must not love me as much as He loves Pastor Mike because it looks like Pastor Mike has it a lot better. Let me tell you, I go through the same crazy, miserable things that you do. But I know that all things work for the good because He's called me according to His purpose, and He loves me. And I love Him. So the promise that God works all things together for good doesn't mean that all things taken by themselves are good. Some things and events are deceitedly bad. But God is able to work them together for good. He sees the big picture. He sees the grand plan. Therefore, those who love God can trust His goodness, His power, and His desire to work out all things for our good. You see, we journey together with Him. We trust in His goodness. And the beautiful thing is, whether you believe it or not, He's still going to do it because God never breaks His promise. He promises all things work for the good, so that's the way it's going to work. We may not see it, but it's going to happen because God never breaks His promise. Well, what does the past, pastor, what, is the, what, what does the goodness of God even mean? The goodness of God means that God is the final standard of good. And that all that God is and does is worthy of approval. Jesus implies this when he says this in Luke 18, 19. No one is good except God alone. We look at the Psalms. They affirm the Lord is good, Psalms 105. Or exclaim, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Even King David says, oh, taste and see the Lord is good. You see, God's goodness is closely related to several other characteristics of his nature. Among them is love and patience and mercy and grace. So if one were to question as to what is good, well, God, good is what God approves. And then one may ask, what is what God approves, why is what God approves good? And we must answer, because He approves it. And He alone is the Creator. He alone is the one that knows all. And He alone knows what's good. And there's no higher standard of goodness than God's own character and His approval of whatever is consistent with that character. God does nothing outside of His character. He's loving. He's good. He's patient. He's just. On the other hand, God has given us some reflection of His own sense of goodness so that when we evaluate things the way that God created us to evaluate them, we will also approve what God approves and delight in the things which He delights. Don't you love to delight in the thing that God delights in? He delights in seeing us walk with Him and talk with Him. And when you do, you start to delight in Him because you get to know Him more and more. See, you're, this, this, this Bible, this Scripture, is not for you to just know the stories in it. It's for you to know who God is, 
walk with him and know and understand what God thinks about you. And he thinks so many precious thoughts about you as there are grains of sand on the seashores. That's a lot. God delights in you, and you're good. How do I know that? Because he created a brand new nature in you. And what God creates is loving and good. Understanding his approval and his statement of you creates for you and me an atmosphere to properly grow. What is that? Absence of guilt and shame. You can't grow in any situation if, abs if shame and guilt is your motivation. You'll live in fear. You won't know what to do. You'll always look to someone else to give you approval. You'll be looking to someone else to determine your value and worth. I beg you to go to Christ and look for your value and worth there and there alone. He accepts you. He gives you His righteousness. And you have an understanding and a power of the Holy Spirit within you. And God loved you so much, so unconditionally, He joined you to His own Son creating this environment of shamelessness and guiltlessness. How so, Pastor? Well, when you trusted in the finished work of Jesus, God the Holy Spirit joined you to Christ so that now you're in union with Him. We look at Colossians 3.3, 3, you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. If your life is hidden with Christ in God, who do you think God sees when He sees you beside Him? His Son, he loves you the same. He sees you as His Son, holy, without blame. How are we joined with Christ? I mean, in what way, Pastor, are we joined with Christ? Look at this. Here's how, according to the Word of God, the Holy Spirit also joins us to the central events in the life of Christ. This is so important. We are in union with and have joined our Lord Jesus in, number one, His suffering. We've joined Him in His death. We've joined him in his resurrection, and we've joined him in his ascension to heaven. The result is that we have become a portrait, a picture of the person and the work of Christ to the Father. Interestingly, God the Father doesn't have to use the events of the death and the resurrection and the ascension to preserve his memory of his son's perfectly finished work. Well, what should he use, Pastor? Pastor? The suffering and the cross would be kind of difficult for one to recall, especially if it would have been our own child. That would be kind of gruesome. Are you ready for the answer what he uses? He uses you. You're the picture of the result of the suffering, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of his son. You're the completed work. You're the finished work of the cross. He looks at you. Do you see the same thing in the mirror, he says? Sees, not says. <laughs> Do you see the same thing when you get up in the morning and look in the mirror? Or do you see something that you're not happy with? God's happy with you. He loves you. See yourself that way. Look at what in Ephesians chapter 2. He looks at us as seeing the beauty and the perfection of the finished work of His Son. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ Jesus. Because of the finished work of His Son... Thus, uniting us with Him, now God can point to you and me in all future ages as an example of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us and shown as all as He's done for us, all who are united with Christ Jesus. I pray that people can see within you the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards you as you have your relationships with one another and throughout the community. You see, if we picture ourselves the way the Father sees us, our lives will be changed and our emotions will be managed. Anxiety and worry will become less as God's comfort and assurance and protection takes us its place in our new self. Living within the understanding of how God pictures us, everything changes. Everything changes when we live in the understanding of how God pictures us. Having been born again in the image and likeness of His Son, we're walking and talking reminders to God of His precious Son on earth. We have to picture ourselves that way. The great outcome of His redemption is you and me. You say, well, so pastor, why did, or better yet, why was God's motivation to redeem us? What was it? God's motive for redeeming us is rooted once again in His goodness, immense love, and a desire for a relationship with us. 
Scripture reveals that God's love is a driving force between His redemptive plan. Look at John 3, 16. Familiar? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What's the Scripture reveal for the motivation? Love. The verse emphasizes that God's love for humanity compelled him to offer his son as a sacrifice for your sins. Additionally, God desired to reconcile us to himself, and it's evident in 2 Corinthians. He says this, All this is for God, from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. Did you know that the Lord has taken the record of your sin and destroyed it and remembers it no more? Why do you remember it? Why do you keep bringing it up? What good is it doing you? Bring up the love of God. Bring up, oh Lord, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for saving me. Praise Him for the reconciliation and the glorification that He's given you because He loves you. This passage I just read underscores that God's motive is to restore the broken relationship between Himself and humanity. And we look at Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. It emphasizes God's love and mercy. Look at this. But because of His great love for you, God, who is rich in mercy, that's a steadfast loving kindness, made us alive with Christ even when you were dead in your transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. In other words, you weren't even alive to respond to God. You had nothing to offer God. There wasn't anything he was looking at in you that said, you know what, I need to go save Mike Turner because he told me he loved me. Mike Turner's dead to himself and to God, and it's God that first loved me, that raised me from the dead, and now I love him. That's the beauty of your Lord. What is it that he first loved us? That now we love him. Do you see the complete finished work of Christ? He's done it all. Because of His great love for us, God who's rich in His mercy made you alive with Christ even when you were dead in your transgressions. And it's by His unmerited favor you've been saved. This shows God's grace and mercy are central to His redemptive plan. Ultimately, God's motive for redeeming us is to bring us into a loving, eternal relationship with Him, allowing us to experience the fullness of life with Christ. He wants us to experience the fullness of life. Are you experiencing the fullness of life, joyful every day because you're walking with Christ? Or have you been told the old story that you need to prove who you are to Jesus, that you need to do things to make Him love you? Do you feel like God... Those are all lies. He loved you. And he loves you right now. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you've gone through, he loves you. For God is love. Look at John 10, 9 through 11. He says, I'm the gate. I'm the door. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely, and I will find them good pastures. The thief, Satan's purpose, look at this, is to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. I'm the good shepherd, he says. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. The joy that you can have is the joy of the Lord. His motivation is love for you and me. Never forget that it is the Father's love for you and me that places us in Christ. It's the Father's love for you and me that places us in His Son. He did not place us in Christ to create a reason to love us. He didn't put us there so we would be loved. He loved us and put us there. Love comes first. As I have previously emphasized, it is critically important to remember that God's love fell upon us before we were saved or placed into Christ. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. But God is so rich in His mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised us Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace you've been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. You're united with Christ. You're joined at the hearts. He homes with you, and nothing can separate you from Him. God's love is driving His desire to have union with the Son. It's His love, and what we have done does not determine the Father's love. 
What He has done for us governs His love towards us. And what He's done for us is revealed in the finished work of Christ. So in closing, these central events of Christ's life being His crucifixion, His death, His burial, His resurrection, ascension, are counted to be our very own. This is critically important to get a hold of. When God the Father looks at His Son, He sees not only us, but He also sees us participating in the great events of Christ's life. He sees us being crucified with Him. He sees us had suffered with Him. He sees us dying with Him. He sees us being buried with Him. And best of all, He sees us being raised from the dead with Him. This makes the difference between hiding in the shadows and living in fear and shame and guilt or living in the light and love of God's goodness and presence. There's your difference right there. Do you know how much God loves you? Or do you feel like you're trying to have to prove who you are in hopes that He'll love you? That is a wrong way to think. And the truth is, He loves you dearly and gave His Son before you even had a chance to love Him. It makes a difference between hiding in the dark shadows and living in fear and living in shame and living in guilt or living in the light and love of God's goodness and His presence. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. We need to see ourselves the way the Father sees us. We are to believe God's point of view of us. You are hidden with Christ in God. He's your loving Father who has placed you in the environment of love, joy, and peace with Him. He is a good, good Father. Let's pray. Father, let the love and the goodness of you permeate our hearts in such a way that there's no doubt that anything that's ever happened in our lives that we've done that we consider maybe to be the biggest event of our failure, that that's been covered by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your righteousness has been placed there also, that now we stand before you holding without blame. Father, let us see us specifically and only in the way that you tell us according to your word. Father, so many events in our life have beat us down to where we feel like we're worthless and we're not valuable. Father, that's so far from your understanding because you created us, you loved us, you lifted us, you died with us, you arose with us. And Father, now we're with you spiritually in the heavenly realms. We even get to go to your throne room in time of need. And Father, that's about 24-7. So, Father, your grace and mercy is there to bathe us in. And, Father, wash away the shame and the guilt that's there. Father, we love you and thank you for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen and amen.